Okay, so today we're going to be finishing up the notes for section D1. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about today is what's called luminosity. Now in the notes it says, the luminosity of a star is the energy it gives off per second, that is, its power output. Um, the symbol that we use for luminosity is a capital L, and of course, because basically what luminosity is, is the power output of the star that is measured in watts, right? or joules per second, if you prefer. Uh, remember, in the case of a star, where that power is coming from is um, stars tend to f uh, undergo nuclear fusion, and they fuse different elements, typically hydrogen, and create a lot of heat um, and energy. And um, that's typically what we're talking about when we talk about the luminosity of a star. That heat, that energy, a lot of light. Obviously, stars give off a lot of light. So. Um, we're going to go on to the next slide. Now, the most important thing that determines luminosity for a star is its mass. And the reason is, again, going back to, you know, where does the luminosity come from? It comes from nuclear fusion. The more mass you have, the more gravitational pressure you have acting inward. So remember, in a stable star, you have that inward gravitational pressure balanced out by the outward radiation pressure caused by the heat of fusion. And so the more mass you have, the more inward pressure you have, and therefore that affects things like temperature. Obvi obviously, if you have more inward pressure, you have all this mass trying to like push inward on itself. That causes the star to be hotter, and if it's hotter, that tends to be brighter as well. Okay, and of course, uh, the other aspect to that is the more mass the star has, um, that also affects its size. And clearly, if it's a bigger star, it's probably giving off more power. So on the next slide, this is slide 86, what does luminosity have to do ma uh, with mass? Um, it talks about how the mass of the star determines the pressure in its core. We talked about that before due to that inward gravitational pressure. Um, and of course, that pressure determines things like temperature, the rate of fusion, which in turn uh, affects things like luminosity. Okay, luminosity is an intrinsic property, it does not depend on distance. And so what that means is if we look at a star and we know it has a given luminosity, that doesn't really depend on how far away the star is. However much power it's giving off, that's how much power it's giving off. And the example in the notes is this 60 watt light bulb, no matter where we view it from, is still having an output power of 60 watts. Right now, if it's farther away, it might not look as bright, but that doesn't affect its actual luminosity. Okay, the only things that affect luminosity are mass, um, indirectly, um, and then things like you know pressure, temperature, rate of fusion, which of course depend on mass directly. So, uh, in the next slide, it says the luminosity of a star is the energy it releases per second. The sun has a luminosity of about 3.9 times 10 to the 26 watts. Now this is typically written with this symbol. This is a capital L, and the subscript is a circle with a dot. That is the convention for doing the luminosity of the sun. So anytime you see that L and a circle with a dot, that stands for the luminosity of the sun. Okay, so that is the luminosity of the sun. And when I say the sun, I mean our sun, of course, of our sun. So you don't need to know the actual value that would be given to you, um, but you do need to know what that symbol means. Uh, the energy that arrives at the Earth is only a very small amount when compared with the total energy released by the sun. Now, if you read that sentence a couple times, you should kind of think to yourselves, Hey, wait, haven't we talked about that before? This idea that the energy that arrives at the Earth is only a small part of the energy emitted by the Sun. And that is actually something we've talked about bef before in the context of the solar constant in the last unit. Okay, and so we'll see that come back here in just a second. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to treat stars as perfect black bodies. And so in the last unit we saw that if you have a perfect black body, then you have the Stefan Boltzmann law, which allows you to calculate the output power from that black body. Now in the context of this unit, instead of calling it power, we call it luminosity, but it's really the exact same thing. And again, there's no emissivity in this equation, 
because we're assuming that stars act as perfect black bodies. And um, we know from the last unit that the Stefan Boltzmann law, which that's what this equation is, is the Stefan Boltzmann law. This equation applies for perfect black bodies. And basically what it does is it relates the power put out by a black body, or in this case the luminosity, to, uh, you know, you've got the Stefan Boltzmann constant, sigma, that's 5.67 times 10 to the negative 8. You have A, which is the surface area of the object, and then you have T, the temperature of the object raised to the fourth power. Now keep in mind that in this equation, T must be in Kelvin. Okay, but we've seen this equation before in topic 8. It's the same Stefan Boltzmann law that we've, you know, enjoyed working with uh, in the past. Okay, so we will see that in the context of stars because we're going to be treating stars as perfect black bodies. Okay, so I'm going to clear this. Going to the next slide, this just kind of goes on about, you know, what is a perfect black body? You should know that from the last unit. Okay, now the other refresher is you have what's called Vine's Law, or Vine's Displacement Law. So remember the two main equations that apply in the context of uh, black bodies is you have the Stefan Boltzmann Law, and then you have Vine's Displacement Law, okay, which you see written here. Um, remember that in this equation, um, Lambda max represents the peak wavelength that that black body is emitting electromagnetic radiation at. Okay, so basically what Vine's law says is that lambda max, that is the peak wavelength measured in meters, times the temperature of the object measured in Kelvin is equal to a constant where the constant is 2.9 times 10 to the negative 3. And the units for this constant are meter Kelvin because Lambda is wavelength in meters, and temperature, uh, T is temperature measured in Kelvin. Okay, so we've seen both of those equations before. So because we've seen both of these equations before, I don't want to harp too much on these concepts. Um, a lot of these things, um, again, we've seen before. We've seen the black body curve before. We talked about its general characteristics. As the temperature of the object increases, the peak wavelength decreases but also the intensity of the electromagnetic radiation also tends to increase. And so here we can see um, this is for, for different uh, the same object uh, at different temperatures. We can see if you take the same object and you heat it to different temperatures, the black body curve starts to shift up and to the left. So in the case of our sun, our sun emits most of its energy at, the, at a wavelength of 500 nanometers. Okay, now that doesn't mean that it emits all of its uh, electromagnetic radiation at that wavelength. Because remember, uh, one of the characteristics of a black body is it emits uh, electromagnetic radiation across all wavelengths, but it does tell us something about the peak. Okay, and so if you use Vine's displacement law and plug in that 500 nanometers, as you see here, you get that the absolute temperature of the outside of the sun is about 5800 Kelvin. Okay, and then this is just another um, example of black body curves. Now, you should understand that based off of the temperature of a star, that affects what it looks like. So here we have th uh, black body curves for three different stars at three different temperatures. So this is a star that's relatively cold. It, um, it has a surface temperature of 3,000 Kelvin. If you look at where the peak wavelength is, the peak wavelength is somewhere in the infrared. Now that doesn't mean the star is visible or uh, invisible, uh, even though infrared radiation is invisible to us, because you still see part of the visible spectrum is covered right here. And the, so this star would look red. Now if you took a star like our sun, you would see that the peak is somewhere in the middle in the green part of the spectrum. Now our sun does not look green, and we've talked about this before, just because the peak wavelength is in the green part of the spectrum does not mean that that object looks green. Because if you look, the whole visible wavelength is kind of evenly covered, and so really what we see is we see all the colors, and so if anything we see that this star would appear um, white or yellow white. So this would kind of be like our sun. And if you had a star that was hot enough, say, 10,000 Kelvin, and you calculate the peak wavelength, it would be over here, probably in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Now, we can't see ultraviolet light, but if you ask, you know, what, what part of the visible spectrum is the most covered um, for the star, it would be 
the blue and violet section. And so this star that's 10,000 Kelvin would be blue or blue-white. So in other words, the coldest stars tend to be red. And as the temperature of a star increases, um, or if you think of different stars with you know increasing temperatures, the hottest stars in the universe tend to be blue. Okay, so why is this important? Well, we can look at a spectrum of stars and get lots of different um, information about that star. If we're looking at the spectrum of light coming from a star, then we can directly measure the peak wavelength um, that the, that um, star is giving off uh, in terms of electromagnetic radiation, and then we can use Vine's law to find the temperature of that star. And if we know the temperature of a star and we know its luminosity, then we can find the radius of the star from this Stefan Boltzmann law. And by the way, this is definitely not how you spell Stefan. Okay, it should be like that. Okay, so just to show you um, an example, we'll do an example with this idea here in just a second. There's one more thing we need to talk about, and that's called apparent brightness. Now, what it says on this slide is it says when the light from the sun reaches the earth, it will be spread out over a sphere of radius d. The energy received per unit time per unit area is b, where b is given by this equation. And so b is what we call the apparent brightness. This lo lowercase b is called apparent brightness. And so you have capital L for luminosity, and you have lowercase b for apparent brightness. Now, if you actually look at what it says on the slide and you think about what it's saying carefully, after a while, hopefully, you recognize, wait a second, isn't this the same thing as solar constant? And yes, it is, actually. And so we've actually talked about this concept before. In the past, we've called it solar constant. Um, but we can generalize it to you know all different types of stars uh, and talk about the idea of apparent brightness. Okay, and so apparent brightness basically takes into account you know how much energy or how much power is a star emitting, and also how far away are we from that star? Because clearly, the farther away you are from a star, the um, the lower uh, apparent brightness you have. Just like when we talked about solar constant, if you go twice as far from a star, the apparent brightness is going to decrease by a factor of four. Okay, so um, apparent brightness is something we can directly measure. All we have to do is just get like a um, like a detector, like a camera or a telescope or something, and measure the amount of power um, from the star that we're looking at and divide by the area of our detector, and boom, we have apparent brightness. And so apparent brightness is something that can be directly measured. Luminosity is not something that can be directly measured, and the same thing with distance, uh, but apparent brightness is something that can be directly measured. Okay, so the idea is that if we can measure the apparent brightness, and then we can somehow find a way to measure D, for example, you know, using st stellar parallax, if we have a star that's relatively close, then we can find the luminosity. And if we can find the luminosity, then we can find some other things. Okay, so I'm going to skip slides 97 and 98. You're welcome to look through them on your own. Um, we have done a calculation like this before. This is just like a basic solar constant calculation. Um, but take a look at example two. It says a star is found to have a luminosity of 4.5 times 10 to the 28 watts and an apparent brightness of 3 times 10 to the negative 8 watts per square meter. Notice that apparent brightness has units of intensity, watts per square meter. Calculate how far away the star is in parsecs. Okay, so the apparent brightness equation looks like B equals L over 4 pi D squared. And again, that's basically the same thing as a solar constant calculation. And so here we're given B. Okay, so I can plug in for B. We're given L. Now you might ask, how do we know what L is for a given star? And that's actually uh, not so easy, but we'll talk more about that later. And we want to know how far away the star is in parsecs. Okay, now in this equation, it's important that you remember that D in this equation is measured in meters. And the way you can easily remember that is look right here. This is watts per square meter. So when we solve for D, we will have the distance, but then we'll have to do a unit conversion to get the distance in uh, parsecs like we want. Okay, so you need to rearrange this equation. I'm just going to type this into my calculator really quickly. Um, 
make sure that you don't make any silly algebra mistakes, obviously. And keep in mind that you should probably get a pretty big number, right? Because these stars are pretty far away. So the value I got, assuming I did this correctly, is 3.45 times 10 to the 17, and that would be in meters. Okay, now once we have the distance in meters, we can easily do a unit conversion going from meters to light years. Okay, so what you would do is you would look at your um, you would look at your conversion factor light years to meters. There are 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters in one light year, and then you would go from light years to parsecs. Okay, and all of these conversions would be uh, given to you. Obviously, um, there's 3.26 light years in one parsec. Okay, so this is just a really simple unit conversion. Again, I'm just going to type that into the calculator. Okay, so I'm going to divide by 9.46 times 10 to the 15, and then divide by 3.26, and I get 11.2 parsecs. Okay, so that is example two. So that's a pretty basic uh, calculation with apparent brightness. Okay, so pause it there if you need to. Okay, and then just to do one more quick example, it says a star is observed from Earth over the course of six months and a parallax angle of 0.74 arc seconds is measured. Okay, so we're using stellar parallax here. The first thing I'm going to do when I see that, by the way, is I'm going to write down my parallax equation, which is this. The light from the star is incident on Earth at a rate of 5.8 times 10 to the negative 8 watts per square meter. Looking at the unit, watts per square meter, I recognize that is B, the apparent brightness, because the apparent brightness should have units of intensity, watts per square meter. Based on observations of the star, its surface temperature is about 7,000 Kelvin. Now you might ask, you know, how would we know that? Well, most likely we would know that by, again, observing the star directly, finding its peak wavelength from our observations, and then using Vine's displacement law to get the temperature. Okay, But it doesn't really matter uh, because we're given that the problem. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find the distance to the star. Remember, when you use the parallax equation, okay, so I'm going to plug in 1 over 0.74, when p is in arc seconds, this equation gives you the distance in parsecs. Okay, so if you type that in, 1 divided by 0.74, you get 1.35, but that's 1.35 parsecs. And so then you have to convert that from parsecs to meters. So 1.3 5 parsecs, 1 parsec is 3.26 light years, okay, that's 3.26 light years, that's Ly, in case you can't read that, and then 1 light year is 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters. Okay, so all I'm going to do is multiply across the top. And again, you should be very aware of all of the units that you're working with. You should get 4.16 times 10 to the 16 meters. Okay, so that answers the first question. Now the second question says calculate the luminosity of the star. Now there's two equations that have luminosity. There's the Stefan Boltzmann law, and then there is the apparent brightness equation. Now in this case, I'm going to use the apparent brightness equation. And what tells me to use that equation is because I am given B in the problem, and I just found D. Okay, and so the apparent brightness equation looks like this. And remember, typically questions kind of guide you along the correct path. So if they just had us calculate the distance to the star in meters, that's probably because they want us to use that. Okay, so we're going to take this equation, rearrange to get L, 
we're just going to work a little bit of math. Um, so I'm just going to do that in my calculator really quickly. I'm going to skip these algebra steps. And then I get a luminosity of the star is 1.26 times 10 to the 27 watts. And it might be a little different because of rounding. Okay, so that's answer one. That's answer two. What is the radius of the star in meters? Now, at this point, it should be a very simple calculation um, because there's basically only one equation having to do with radius in this unit. And that is using the Stefan Boltzmann law, keeping in mind that A is the surface area of the object, in this case, the star. And so for a star, A would be 4 pi r squared times t to the fourth. And so now that we have t and we have l, we can go find r. Okay, so that would just be the square root of l over sigma times 4 pi times t to the 4. And again, I'm just going to kind of skip some of these steps. 10 to the negative 8 divided by 4 pi and then divide by t to the power 4 so 7,000 raised to the power 4 okay so once you type this into the calculator you should get this answer okay the answer I got uh, for the radius let me take the square root was 5.6 times 10 to the power, let me just convert into scientific notation in my calculator. Okay, 5.6 times 10 to the 8 meters. And that is the radius of this star, which is pretty big, but that should make sense because it's a star. Okay, so those are just some basic calculations using luminosity and apparent brightness. Okay, so pause it here if you need to. Okay, and then just to briefly mention this slide right here, this is basically the end of D1. Uh, the idea here is that we can put all these pieces th together. If there's a star that's close enough where we can measure the distance using stellar parallax, then uh, we can directly measure the apparent brightness just based off our observations. That gives us the luminosity. Based off of looking at the spectrum that the star gives off, we can find the peak wavelength and then use Vine's law to find the temperature. And by the way, the spectrum also gives us information about the chemical composition of the star. Um, we've talked about before how atomic spectra are unique for different elements. And then we can put all that together to find out the size of the star using the Stefan Boltzmann law. Okay, now, um, so what I want you to realize is that number one, we can, just from very indirect observations, we can actually find out a ton of information about a star, which is very cool. Now, typically speaking, the trick is finding the distance to a star, because remember, um, you can only use stellar parallax for stars that are relatively close to us. Okay, the, I think the limit is about, you know, a couple hundred light years, maybe. Keep in mind, just our galaxy by itself is like 100,000 light years um, across and so this only works with stars that are relatively close okay so what we're going to talk about later is there's many other methods or techniques to use to find the distance to a star besides the stellar parallax thing okay but the idea is if you find the distance in some by some means you can use all these other observations to find out uh, other pieces of information about the star okay so that concludes d1 Please let me know if you have any questions. You should now be able to uh, finish reading D1 in your, in your textbook and completing the assigned problems in the textbook.